I've got your number lab testing. Um, you know, if you guys are reading the brief here, we're going to attempt to show uh, how this panel can help uh, explain how analytics can help your grow or help your business. Um, I'm sure most of us, as we've done things, we understand that collecting data is basically how we learn from previous mistakes. Um, labs can help us do that by, you know, testing our products and letting us know where we're at at any point in the process. So we have some great panelists here who've been working in industry and can give us uh, some information. Uh, before I get started, I just want to get a show of hands. Who here is already running a grow? Uh, just one, okay. And who here is already on the manufacturing side or in business in California? Okay, the reason why I ask, I just want to make sure that I make this panel as informative for folks. Um, most of us here are struggling with the actual realities of being in business, uh, but I think that might be not as informative, like there are problems that we do need to solve, but uh, getting into it and how you find a lab, how you access a lab, and what you might need from a lab are probably the things that we should cover. So first, why don't I allow the panelists to introduce themselves, and then uh, we'll get into some of the topics of conversation. Steve, do you want to start? Sure. sure. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Steve Bell. I'm, I'm from the uh, field sampler for Steve Hill Labs for all of Southern California, California up until uh, last December when they shut us down with the BCC. And, uh, now I'm uh, doing some, uh, I'm actually going to be an extractor soon. I'm waiting for a facility to be built in Long Beach. And uh, I'm also a former grower for 13 years. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> my name is Gene Gallup. Um, I'm a co-founder of uh, Capital Labs and Capital Systems. Uh, Capital Labs is a California cannabis manufacturer with process for, you know, anybody that's looking to get oil out of uh, we also have an in-house brand, which is called the Bloom brand. Uh, we're in four different states manufacturing that. Uh, we also manufacture a line of extraction equipment through the company uh, brand, which is uh, Captain Systems. So I have uh, probably about 10 years of experience in extraction and manufacturing, and about at this point, about two and a half years in manufacturing of the equipment as well. Glad to be of service here today. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Marsh. I am the lab director at the Neva Labs. We are a contract research and compliance testing laboratory located in Los Angeles. Uh, prior to that, I was the lab director for Evio Labs up in Berkeley, and prior to that, I was the lab manager at Steedville. That was a, a very career. He's gone, gone through a lot of things. <laughs> and it's been a good two years. Good year. <laughs> so, uh, my name is John McKay. Um, Currently, I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm with Newbridge uh, Global Ventures. I did start my own company called Synergistic Technology Associates after a 29-year career at a company called Waters Corporation. And at Waters Corporation, we made liquid chromatographs, mass spectrometers, and such. Awesome, thanks. So, I guess we should start with why would somebody want to engage a testing lab? I mean, above and beyond compliance, uh, how can a lab help us refine our business? Why don't we start with Chris? Like, why, if you were entreating these folks to come to your lab to test, what would be some points you might want to give them? Well, I think some obvious benefits of using a lab are just improving the quality of your product, uh, the consistency of your product from batch to batch. You know, prior to uh, the requirement for lab testing, uh, you could get a gummy bear that may have been 10 milligrams of THC or CBD or maybe not. Uh, and it's really hard to know unless you actually probe that and test it. Um, so ultimately, using, using a lab is a benefit to public health. It's a benefit to your process, um, to making sure that you, know, you have a predictable production or a manufacturer or cultivation of what you're, um, what you're making or growing. And then also, if, if you're buying product, you know, making sure that if you buy that biomass, uh, you want to make sure that's clean before you use it, because if you're going to buy that and then distill it down and, and just extract it into concentrate, it may look clean, but once you concentrate it, it might be very dirty. So uh, going through all of those cases um, throughout your process um, is, is, is you know, really important and will help your company grow. Awesome. And Steve, maybe you could uh, explain, uh, since you've had run-ins with the BCC, um, exactly what compliance testing looks like in California, especially for I assume most people are here on the farming side, hence the name of the panel. Any manufacturers in here or would-be manufacturers? Right, a little mix. Um, okay, yeah, so from a farming side, uh, I have a farm, I now want to bring my product to market. What does the BCC require? The BCC requires you to have uh, category three testing, which is um, potency, oh my gosh, I don't have the list. Uh, 
I'll help you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I appreciate it. So basically, you guys, um, the BCC did phase in testing, but for the folks who are just starting to get in, you will be coming into the full phase of testing, which means category three uh, pesticides, which I believe is 128 total pesticides that are tested for now. Um, also heavy metals, there's four heavy metals that we test for, a variety of residual solvents, and that's in addition to getting potency. On the flower side, the potency, Potency is not regulated, so if your flower is X percentage, that's fine, as long as it tests clean for residual solvents, heavy metals, and pesticides. On the manufacturing side, regardless of what you're making, it's very important to note that everything that you put in to the product will be tested like cannabis, right? Because here in California, we test finished goods as the final compliance test, right? So, for example, if you're making a brownie and it has walnuts, you are not going to find walnuts that are going to pass muster here because there are not walnuts made that don't have certain trace pesticides that are banned from cannabis, right? So it's little things like that to, to watch out for. Um, also, when we're looking for labs, we're looking for turnaround time and consistency in the production flow. Maybe, Gene, you can explain like how that is important to our business in terms of making sure that the lab is a good partner so that we can have process flows because similar to what happened with Steam Hill, if the turnaround time is wrong, it cascades, right? Correct. So. I mean, expect, expect delays, delays when you're getting into this, and uh, if, if you're putting, putting in proper safety, safety protocols and testing protocols uh, in your manufacturing, manufacturing uh, yeah, I would highly recommend that you test at every single uh, stage of handling, right? So extraction, there should be a test after that, you know, and then after distillation, there should be another test because there's always that fear of cross-contamination. Um, you know, human error is also a thing. Something as simple as somebody, you know, uh, disinfecting a jar and not fully drying it could potentially hit for a residual solvent. Um, unfortunately, because all of the labs in town are, are very backed up, you know, there's a lot of business happening right now and it's probably really good for you guys, but um, it puts a lot of delay into the process, right? So, you know, prior to all of this testing and back when it was a little bit of the gray area market, you know, you just make your product, you test it once, just out of the ethical goodness of your heart, and then it goes out to market. Turn around from plants to finished goods, one week. Now, because there's delays in the testing processes, right, so sometimes it's like, it takes maybe a week, maybe nine, 10 days for a lab to turn around the test result. You must, you know, obviously plan for that. So when the trim comes in, that's, a, that's test one. And then when the oil is first extracted, that's test two. And that, at every stage, you know, tack on another five to 10 days and uh, know that this is going to happen for you and plan accordingly. And I, I quite add that. Um, yep. A lot of people think, uh, oh, well, the testing lab just maybe want you to test more because it's better. No, for no, no. It's not true. No, not true. If, if you get, get to the, the final product, product and you test and it fails, is that, what, what's the cost of that failure? If you go back, maybe you can remediate. There's That's a right. whole line of production that gets held up. Uh, so it really does benefit you to test. Uh, at every step of the way because you will save money. You will save money rather than having to destroy a whole batch for compliance, right? We mentioned that, that it has to be tested in the packaging. So that means you have a batch of, let's say, you know, 10,000 brownies, cookies, vape cartridges, whatever that is. In order for it to go out to compliance testing, all 10,000 have to be packaged, stickered, and labeled. It has to be in quarantine, right? So if that one test at the end of everything comes back and you're hot for something, you've destroyed your packaging, your vessels, and the oil and, and whatever miscellaneous other uh, ingredients and components your product, product makes up. up. That's, that's it, it. bottom line. Yeah. That, that's a huge problem here in California. It's one of the things that, look, this is a nascent industry. You guys, uh, it, the, the window's still open. So even if you're not in business yet, I strongly encourage you to get in the cannabis business. It's growing, um, but some of the problems that you will encounter as you go down are exactly that. Uh, testing and finished goods, testing and, and final packaging is something unique to California. It's not how Washington, Oregon, in Colorado currently do it. It's something that we're still fighting. You know, so when we see these regulations, uh, they're onerous, they're usually about uh, covering regulators' butts because they're just starting. So we still have to continue to have these panels, have these conversations, and push back a little bit on Sacramento. But there's also things we can do, and uh, you know, cannabis has largely been a self-regulating industry up until recently with you know, uh, adult use. But I wanted to ask John, since you've uh, manufactured uh, devices and systems, um, the lack of standards, the lack of consistency amongst labs in California is an interesting thing. It might be a little bit high level for, for, for this group, but if you could just speak on how uh, machines get rolled out and how they're standardized or the attempts to standardize them. Sure. 
So, so it's, it's typically not the uh, instrument that's the fault. It's usually the, there's humans involved. And every time a human is involved, you just add it on 4%. So from the time you, you know, have you touch that sample, it's 4%. And then you just accumulate that. So the instrument only knows what you gave it. So if you give it a vial that has a certain number of molecules in it, it counts the molecules. If the instrument is not calibrated, so that it knows how many molecules it's supposed to be touching, then it will start to give an answer that's incorrect. So when you go back through on every, that's why the regulations have you on, on ISO 17025. It's a wonderful number. And on that, it provides the laboratory an opportunity to have a piece of paper that says step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, so all those steps. But one of the things that the first step is it's called uh, content uniformity. It's also called um, cleanliness. Um, it's a, um, you have IQ, OQ, PQ, which are all qualifiers. So the first thing that instrument has to do in the morning is it has to run a standard. Known amount, it runs a standard. If it can't get the standard right, it means that the instrument itself is out of calibration. So it doesn't matter if the human now touches it, you've already got two or three percent wrong there. So you have to do a nice, uh, a nice, the first thing the instrument has to do. So on an SOP, it should say it starts up in the morning, I run standards. If I don't run this, if the standards aren't correct, what's my next step? And the next part on the amusing side for me are the standards themselves. Um, so can, you, uh, sorry, can you clarify for everybody what, what a standard is? Ah, okay. So I have um, a bag of M&Ms. And I have blue M&Ms and I have red M&Ms. Well, I want to make sure that that bag always has 10 blue M&Ms. And so a standard comes in and says, here's a bag of M&Ms. It's got 10 blue M&Ms. It's got three red and two yellow. But all the, the 10 M&Ms, I want to make sure that that instrument knows that I have 10 M&Ms. And that standard means it's pure. It only has that compound into it, plus or minus something. So now I have, I have 10 M&Ms, blue M&Ms. And, and so, so that's, that's what a standard is. What, what happens in this industry <coughs> is that sometimes you take, take those 10 blue M&Ms, and, and after three hours, <laughs> if you don't have it in the freezer, it's now nine M&Ms. It has nine blue M&Ms and one red M&M. You no longer have a standard because the laboratory itself has not put it into the place. Or from the time that it was at the place to have 10 M&Ms, Something bad happened and it already has one red M&M &M and nine blue. So when we, because I heard the giggle on the standards. So when I was testing standards, no matter what standard it was, I would test it and there was always, it was never a standard. Standard was it wasn't a standard. And so other than that, everything's going great. So when you, have a, when you have an answer, it may not be the laboratory. It may not be the laboratory's fault. They're using a standard to have it. Am I allowed to tell one amusing story? It's about a four minute story. Okay, okay, I'll go for it. it. What the heck? Oh, is this on film? Never mind, mind about the story. story. No, it's good. <laughs> so when, when I, I went back through, there was a state that, that I helped them with the standards. And I helped them to write the standards for that state. And, and when, when I went, went to them along the way, my, there were five companies that were involved and the state had to do the standards. And they, and they were giving the wrong answer. They said, no, nope, your, your product isn't good. No, nope, your product isn't good. And everyone's going, why isn't my product any good? I'm, I'm using it. So, so what they had done is they were leaving the standards out and they read them out at room temperature, feeling that they could use that standard for a month at room temperature. That's not happening. And so I called them up and said, you might want to talk to the vice. They said, no, no, that's how we said, No, that standard, you crack it open and, and that's it. So it comes in an ampule. And they were leaving it out for a month. So they were disqualifying all of the companies based on the fact that they weren't running they didn't know how to do it. So they called up and, and, and the company said, no, that, that lasts for like five minutes. You can't have that after room temperature. <laughs> and so it's, it, it's the states, it's other people getting used to cannabinoid standards, so. Yeah, so look, I, I'm on the manufacturing side. Uh, I have a company called Pop and Barkley and we do a lot of testing. Um, and this is an interesting point to make in California. We are nascent industry. It's the beginning. Um, so test early, test often and test with multiple labs, right? Because the labs are the gatekeepers. If you fail, the BCC will not allow your products to go to market. 
and that's just where it's at. The labs do have some issues that they're working out. Um, when we had a pre-conversation, they are also up against tech companies that, even if, you, even if they get good standards, not all tech companies want to sell them standards and work with cannabis companies, right? Standards are expensive, and so yeah, like John said, you don't, you have to either refrigerate it or use new ones every time, every day when you calibrate the machine, and they're trying to run a business, so that may not be always happening. There's human error. So on our side, on the business side, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a manufacturer, you're going to want to work with multiple labs. You're going to want to test often, right? And you know, like with all data, one data point is irrelevant. Several data points starts to build a picture. And so the way to fight, unfortunately, inconsistencies in lab testing is to have several points of data so you can understand how your stuff is testing and why, and you can start to work with the labs. In our company, we're just getting to the level where we want to bring on, not necessarily in-house testing, but uh, competent uh, evaluators that can look at the testing results from, uh, you know, usually we get the testing results, all I get is a number, but there is a computer chromatograph uh, that needs a skilled operator to read. Um, you know, your company needs to be large to onboard somebody like that, but the point is you do need to invest in testing because they are the gatekeepers of our product, right? Um, so I, I, I don't want to um, go on about like all the things that are wrong because I understand most folks are trying to get into the industry. So um, I do want to ask another question um, to, uh, to, to, to Steve, I mean not to Steve, to, um, to Chris about uh, testing early and how especially at the farm level it's important to test your bat, your plants even from the time they're in veg so that you can start to see problems early on. Can you comment on that? Maybe important to test the soil. Yeah. yeah. That's so, so yeah, we, we, we don't think, even, we, not only should you be testing your, you know, your plants all the way through, um, before you even plant the seed though, I would ask a, a testing lab, maybe a couple, to come in and do some environmental swabbing. Make sure you're clean, there's no microbes growing or mold, bacteria. If you've got that from the onset, you're going to have a bad time. You know, it's hard to catch it down the road, so you want to test early, test often. Um, and like we said before, if you're going to be concentrating these things, if you're buying biomass, demand a COA of a free extract, a bench top extract, a couple grams. You know, you can really get a good idea. It doesn't have to be a fancy process. You can get a great idea of what's going to be in that that, that concentrate um, if you if you concentrate it down before you buy the biomass. Um, and let's see. Uh, this is especially true, I think, with with now we've got to test for heavy metals. So if you're making concentrate. And it looks great, it's passing all of your heavy metals uh, all the way through the process, and then you let it sit in a big cartridge, maybe that came from China, it's like one of the cheaper ones, it's been sitting there for a couple months. You get heavy metal. You get heavy metal. <laughs> so there's certainly, there's certainly, I mean, I'm sure that you guys have a yeah, lot more absolutely. with this too, yeah, there's, there's certainly some cartridges that are more uh, higher quality than others, and that's a big problem right now. People are getting surprise fails, uh, and we don't want surprise fails. I certainly don't want that for my clients. I think it's really heartbreaking, it can really help the, the process and be you know, very costly. Yeah, uh, I could touch a little bit also. Um, so, you know, as, as a processor of cannabis, uh, we don't actually grow our own cannabis. We're constantly sourcing. We work with multiple farms. And, um, you know, uh, things like mold also, you know, that shows up. And if it shows up early in your testing, and you, you know, you'll understand that, oh, it's already here. Then you can make an uh, educated decision on whether, you know, is it worthwhile continuing with this crop or will you take it all down and, and, and put new seed down. Um, uh, other things like, what was it? I just saw my wife pick up the phone and try to take a video and it completely took me off. <laughs> Thanks, babe. That's what, I, that's what I was saying. Oh, but uh, also, okay, I'm sorry. I, right back to it. Uh, another thing is, is farming communities, right? So. Uh, our facilities in Greenfield, California, it's a huge farming community, they grow everything. Um, now they have allowed cannabis, and what we see there regularly is uh, they spray with like airplanes. So the crops that are growing literally, you know, across the fence are getting sprayed by an airplane. So, you know, you're thinking about like, well, you know, where's the wind going to carry it? You might hit hot for a pesticide that you've never used before because you, you're right next to some farm and this is how they, you know, disseminate their pesticide. Well, it seems like a classic example, too, we were talking earlier. Uh, organic doesn't necessarily mean clean, everyone. Uh, I had somebody bring to me a sal topical that was beeswax-based and uh, they had been testing our con their concentrates with us, flying, past flying colors, 
and then they, they sent in their final product, product and it failed because there was a pesticide called Kumafos present in the beeswax. Mm -hmm. And Kumafos is specifically used to control uh, the, like the process that of making the honey in the beeswax. And uh, they, they didn't know. They thought, oh, organic, it's so great. And yeah, organic is great, it can be. But you need, still need to test it. It doesn't mean it's clean. And yeah. everything again, oh, maybe you just have to dilute your beeswax and you're fine. But uh, you, you want to test it early so there's no surprises. Yeah, and the uh, OMRI rated, all that stuff. If it says OMRI rated on the on the on the jar, uh, you know, it, it it doesn't mean anything for cannabis because if you could put it in your food, doesn't mean you could put it on your cannabis. Yeah, I think the takeaway here, guys, is that cannabis regulations are a little onerous. They are far above what's generally regarded as safe. And again, remembering the point that whether it's raw flour or a mixed product, whether vape card or edible. Um, it's going to be tested as a flower product, right? So the Kumufos is, you know, my company had to deal with that. Generally regarded as safe is in all other products at certain levels, B products. Um, however, it's a pesticide that's banned for cannabis, and so when it shows up in your finished good, you will have a fail. So one thing I think to take away from here is that you have to be looking and thinking about compliance testing from day one, right? So I have heard horror stories of drift, uh, like, you know, the, a guy up in, um, I want to say it was like, Mendo, like Southern Mendo, uh, had his farm adjacent to an apple orchard, and everything was fine, had had already a harvest, and then one day in the fall, this guy contracts a plane, comes through, and yeah, they try to do it early in the morning where there's less of a breeze, but drift is a real thing, so as you're looking for your farm, be aware, right? I mean, and, and look, if you're, depending on what you're producing, if you're producing the hemp cultivar for paper or seed stock, you're probably okay, but if you're producing a cultivar, whether it's, uh, you know, for THC-based cannabis or CBD-based cannabis, um, you're going to want to make sure that nobody's growing a seeded plant next to you as well, right? Because pollen travels like that. So we just have to pay more attention to our environment, our packaging, our protocols than others, right? Because you may have great clean flour, you might have tight SOPs for manage, manufacturing your product, but the bar set by California for finished goods is quite high. So you should kind of, uh, you know, for instance, every time I come up with a formulation, before I can even really think about delivering that product, I want to send out all the excipients, all those materials out for testing, right? Similar to uh, what Chris was saying about organic, as a farmer, even though I have a raised flower bed, even though I'm amending my own soil with organics, that doesn't mean that some of those organics may not have, for instance, heavy metals, right? Lead and arsenic are naturally occurring substances in soil and, and in amendments, right? At certain levels, it's not a problem. Cannabis as a great bioaccumulator loves that stuff, right? And it will show up in your test results. Um, another point that was mentioned here that I just want to reiterate is when you test your flower, it's important to also test a concentrate of that flower, right? Typically, if you're just a flower provider, a pre-roll provider, and that's strictly your vein, then you're probably okay. But if you're going to do anything else with that flower, concentrate it to sell the oil or to make a manufactured product, you're going to want to test that uh, concentrate. It's like a canary in a coal mine. Literally, the flower may test clean, but when we concentrate in the oil, we're also concentrating all the pesticides, all the heavy metals, and they may pop at that point. So that's important. Um, all right, so thinking again holistically, what advice would we give to new farmers and new manufacturers in terms of selecting a lab? Uh, Steve, do you have any thoughts on that? I'd look for a lab that's been around and has a good track record, um, somebody that has a low turnaround time and actually can produce that for you. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I would look at um, who's running it. You know, <laughs> I'm pretty sure every lab at this point has a website with a this is us page, and so you want you want somebody that's at least a master's degree analytical chemist, I believe, would be. Or, or a lot of experience. Or a lot of experience. I think if my recommendation is press the labs on a couple things before you even engage. If they aren't ISO accredited in each test. I would consider avoiding them until they are. Uh, and if they say they are, ask them for something called a validation report. Every lab should have a packet of information that says, for this test, for heavy metals, I went through and I show that I can get, I can get the accurate result every single time across the range that we have to test for. And ask them, hey, where's the data? Can you show me your uncertainty values? You're ISO accredited. You're required to have uncertainty reports. So ask for that to know exactly what the tolerance is. 
Press them on the data because the data right now is, is the most crucial thing for you to pass the compliance testing. So the, um, on, on my side, it's um, whenever anyone asks me if they ought to get in the laboratory business, I always say no. There's, a, there's cheaper ways to have a lot of people hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Too true. And it's, you know, if you're amiable, this isn't the right place to be. If you don't give a sugar about whatever people think, you, you could be a good lab manager. <laughs> but uh, so, so most of the time, it's, it's having someone with an experience that has it in analytical chemistry that understands that you want error, you want, you know, triplicate. You want, if you don't have an error bar, nothing good is coming next. Because you have one point, and one point does not, does not give you statistically valid um, information. And so that's the other one. The other one to remember is, um, is, is to allow, is to interview them on site. Go in, watch what they do. Watch the people that, they're, that are working there, what kind of skill sets they have. Because if they're not wearing safety glasses or they're not wearing gloves, Nothing good is coming next. You know, there's always going to be something somehow that picks up. You know, so, you know, I don't know. Everything's good. They don't have gloves. Those are the things to look for because if they have someone that's compliant on glasses, on, on, on the lab code and what they do, and they're walking, those are the things that you You look for the little tiny things that you would hope to um, have your child date. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, you, know you, you typically don't care who you're dating, but you're very specific about who your daughter's dating. <laughs> and so, that, would, would you allow them to date your daughter? Yeah, I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's a high bar. I guess I'm not testing with any lab. Um, okay, so guys, we have about 20 minutes uh, left. I, I did want to re reiterate uh, some of the takeaways there. You know, when looking for a lab, yeah, it's very important to go visit them. Most of them will offer you a tour. Uh, you want to see the cleanliness. You want to see how the operators are. Again, remembering that these people are gatekeepers to your product, yeah. right? Make no mistake. The BCC does not have, first of all, they're not fully staffed out, and they just are not sympathetic. If the lab reports a failure, that's it. You can put a remediation plan in. Right there, you're in a rabbit hole of weeks. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to send the letter, a letter to the BCC or an email, but it tends to feel like you sent it into a void. <laughs> Several weeks later, they get back yeah. to you. Maybe they approve your remediation plan, but the entire time, your goods are technically tied up. As metric comes online, it will be more and more difficult without a lab release to even force your products to market. Right now, there's still some squishy room, and yeah, people are just sometimes, if they have the right dispensary connection, the dispensary may not be asking for that compliance COA or whatnot, but in the future, as we move more towards a regulated environment, that lab will be the gatekeeper. And it's, it's probably one of the biggest decisions you need to make, right? So evaluating multiple labs, testing early and often are all these themes that will help ensure that that part of your business goes smoothly. It's one of the few parts that we cannot control, but definitely determine whether we're going to be successful in business or not, right, as far as processes. So with the remaining time, I definitely want to open it up to questions. Um, there's a lot, of, lot to unpack here. Are there any uh, questions? Sir? Thank you. With all the assays that I've seen, I see no assays with regard to oxidation of fats. And okay, there you go. There you go. So, with in saying that, uh, are we worried about oxidation of these fatty acids in these products over time? Are we looking at different assays to uh, test that? And which assays do you find that are most efficacious to determine oxidation in these products? Uh, so, yeah, so I think what you're getting at is like stability testing for products, especially those like that are with mixed excipients. Um, I, don't, I don't even know if that's required. Anybody? Like right now, I don't, like, you know, standard OTC requires stability tests for shelf life. Uh, most people say a year right off, and I think that's what the BCC requires. But right now, that's not even a thing. What are you guys doing in that respect? It's not, it's, at least it's not required from the BCC. Um, and I, I want to kind of go back to what you were saying about being the gatekeeper. Yes, we decide if you're sample passes, but you, sh you know, we want to be a partner. So if you're worried about that stability, uh, partner with labs and talk to them about getting that testing. As far as the tests go, I think one of the obvious ones is potency tests. You know, we all know that THC degrades to CDN over time. And if your product's been sitting on the shelf for nine months to a year, you know, is it going to be the same product 12 months down the road? 
it may be it may not be, especially if there's other molecules and uh, factors present like pH. Yeah, for instance, we make a THCA product, so an actual raw product, and it wants, to, you look at it and it wants to degrade, right? Um, so getting that product to stay stable, making sure that you have good uh, information on your packaging in terms of storing in a cool, dry place and keeping out of direct sunlight will help. But yeah, raw THC products over a year change. There's just no question, and you just, that has to just be called out to the user. Um, just personal experience of other uh, mixing Delta-9 into other fatty acids like coconut oil, butter, that kind of stuff, fairly stable um, as long as they're, they're, they're uh, not exposed to heat or sunlight. And are there antioxidants that are approved for usage in these products? <clears throat> you mean like, uh, like other antioxidant like excipients? Well, just, just in the fatty acid industry, we know that there's oxidation that's going to take place over time. And if that degradation occurs, we're going to get metallic taste in an end product. Uh, antioxidants are used daily in everything that we use in order to prevent this. Is this something that's used in this industry? No, not, not that I know of. Like, no, no, I don't know of, a, maybe these gentlemen know of a product maker that specifically used, well, first of all, most of the time we use Delta-9, which is more stable, right? The raw product definitely wants to oxidize to Delta-9, right? So the THCA wants to break off. It's inherently unstable. But since most products are Delta-9 products, uh, I don't believe that it's a great idea, though. Thank you. I, yeah, the idea of using an antioxidant mixed with THCA uh, for longer stability is, is interesting. So what happens sometimes is that we clean up the product so much that the plant has its own natural antioxidants. And then we clean it up so much, and then we wonder why it oxidizes, which is hollow. And so, um, so I've typically thrown in some vitamin E you know, as an antioxidant. No, I would go natural, but you can certainly buy the synthetic, but it's a typical pharmaceutical thing. That's why we always see the vitamin E, vitamin A's in the pharmaceuticals as a natural antioxidant. And remember that that vitamin E has to pass muster, right? So the synthetic tends to have a lot more residual solvents. I can tell you that vitamin E is the most expensive part of our product, above the cannabis, because if you want clean vitamin E that's testing, it's not rancid, right? And this goes batch to batch. Again, you guys... Sourcing for our industry is in difficult, so make sure before you start to scale up that you're really tight on your supply chain, and everything in your supply chain needs to be tested as if it was a canvas product. Vitamin E is a real interesting one because from the same manufacturer, I'll get batches that are awesome, and then batches that are not, and so now as I get these 55-gallon drums, I open them right on spot, I inspect them there, and then I nitrogen seal them myself and store them properly because I've had batches come in where I didn't look at it, and then all of a sudden I'm in the middle, middle, of, middle of a production run, we open it up, and it's clearly not right, you know? Um, you had a question, sir? Uh, yes, in, in regards to using multiple labs to test your product, has anyone seen the situation, or what would the BCC do if, let's say, you use three labs and one of them came back, tripped at something? Yeah, came that, back? that's unfortunately not allowed. So you want to, I, this, I mean, the gentleman can comment, I personally uh, have used multiple labs because I'm trying to build more data points, right? And basically more labs giving me a set of errors starts to reinforce my process, and then I can push that back, right? However, when you do your compliance test, this is a great note for you guys, when you do your compliance test with the BCC, that's it. That's where it stops. There is no retesting. There is no other lab. You then put in a remediation plan. <laughs> you go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, actually, I, I, could, I, I have, have lots, lots of experience, experience with that. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, our, our personal, personal preference, preference at this point is to use one, one lab. Uh, we made that mistake early on with going out and uh, trying to validate one lab's results with another lab's result, and then we got two different results. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about like a, a variation in the potency, let's say a couple of percent, which is normal. Like there's a pesticide in this test and there's no pesticide in this test. You take it to a third lab, there's a completely different result there. None of the three match up. So, you know, uh, I think when, when shopping around you know, you can do that, you know, kind of find who you want to work with best, but when you do find that one lab that you're, you know, comfortable with and you're building a rapport, stick with that lab. Um, in regards to, all right, if you, if you have, you know, if you went out to three different labs and one of them uh, hit for a pesticide, um, well, technically you're on notice, but you could always have another lab, or I mean, one of the two, one of the three to re-verify that and always request the chromatograms, right? So the test result that they send to you is, you know, it's numbers on a paper and some words and stuff, but the chromatogram is gonna be something that you could actually take then to any third party analytical chemist. It's not in the cannabis industry. They'll look at those peaks 
and then they'll be able to tell you, all right, is it there or is it not? We had one of these instances where, you know, uh, at our very last QA test is in packaging. Before we send it off to uh, uh, compliance, we always package the, uh, uh, package the batch, send it off for one final QA, uh, and then it goes, you know, de de depending on what that's like, we'll, we'll either uh, send it for compliance or destroy it. So eight tests during the manufacturing confirm that this is all clean. The final one comes back from the same lab in packaging says that there's a uh, below, uh, it's a LOQ, right, of uh, chlorphenopur. And uh, you can't have any of that. There's no value that is allowable. And we ended up having to destroy this batch. It was a hasty kind of mistake because it took me about two weeks to get to the bottom of it, request the chromatograms, da da da. And when I got on the call with uh, the lab guy, the, 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 the lead scientist, at this lab, and I told him, I said, hey, I have you know, two other uh, chemists, look at this. They can't find it. He said, oh, you know what? If we, went to, uh, if we went to compliance, we would have passed it because our tech wasn't really sure if it's there or not. And I was like, dude, that cost me like 300 grand. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's very like, let's just say, I don't use that lab anymore. You know what I mean? So uh, find the lab. Yeah, go ahead. And with that, I want to say, too, uh, right now the labs are still struggling across the board because there's no standard methods at all to, to reference. Uh, what I mean by standard method is I can't go in the pharmaceutical industry or environmental testing, I could go to a website and find a method for the analysis of pesticides in drinking water. Uh, and there's that for many different products across many different industries. Right now, cannabis has none of that. And Susan Aldino and the great people at AOAC and the Cannabis Analytical Science Program are working on developing those, but it's still in progress and it takes time and it's, it's very difficult. Cannabis, it's like analyzing Italian dressing, you know, it's oily bits, watery bits, you've got to separate them and it's just a mess. So it is, it's, you know, um, I'm not trying to make excuses for labs, but from a, um, you know, from, from your point of view, it behooves you to check out the different labs and see what they're doing. Are they consistent? You know, would you let them take your daughter? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know check, check, check them out and, and make sure that they're giving you results that, um, that are consistent in what you expect. And I'm not saying lab shop for the, the lab that's going to give you the best PO or, you know, no pesticides at all when you know you've got stuff in there because that's also wrong. So you want to try and get the most accurate lab that's going to work for your product. Uh, and, and, and ideally in a perfect world, you go to any lab, but that's just not the case right now. Yeah. And, and it's important to note, for those of you who don't know, that uh, when we say compliance testing, that happens in California in-house, right? So we, all the other tests you send to them, or some of them, back in the day, they used to have couriers because allegedly we're not supposed to mail our stuff. Um, but when they do compliance testing, the way California requires it is they show up in, I guess, their Tyvek suits. It happens on camera. And basically, you have a batch, let's say, on a pallet, and they point to random boxes and then they pick random numbers, it's a, and it's a number based on the batch, so if the batch is 100 units, it's one, if it's 1,000 units, it's 10, I don't know if those numbers are accurate, but something like that. So uh, just, that's just a good note to know, that they will be coming to your facility to get those samples, uh, which makes it even more difficult. Uh, any other questions related to testing? No? All right. Super important. I just wanna ask, so the BCC does the testing themselves? No. No, they, they, so the BCC sets out the regulations, right? So, it's in, yeah, it's, it's interesting because the lab does the testing. If, they, if you fail, they report your license number and batch number to the BCC, and you get a letter or a note from the BCC saying you failed. They're actually pretty good about that. Again, that's, yeah, that part they're good at. And it's, it, and look, yeah, they're, they, you know, right now, with respect, the BCC and all the, reg and CDPH and uh, the ag, portion of that that does the farms, I forget their acronym, um, are all just trying to cover their butts, right? They're all just trying to make sure that we're not diverging cannabis out to, outside of the regulated environment and there's some nod towards consumer safety, right? It's not fully baked, no pun intended. But the, um, but the, um, but the, 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 their deal is, yeah, if something is wrong, they're going to move to quarantine it immediately, they're going to send you that letter. You're then going to say, oh, no, wait, it's this, and you're going to want to remediate, that takes time, right? So they're not trying to get products to market. That's our job. Their job is to basically make sure that this industry doesn't blow up in our face and that something doesn't go wrong. While I firmly, as an advocate, believe that cannabis is 100% non-toxic, 
I have no qualms about putting out the products that I've put out for the last two decades before regulations. However, the BCC is charged with ushering in a new world of cannabis and adult use, and they're super cautious, right? So as soon as the lab has a failure, they send a note to the BCC. BCC contacts you to quarantine that batch uh, until they figure out, until you figure out with them how to remediate. That's a great point, too, about, about the BCC with cannabis. You know, cannabis has been, I think, rolled out relatively well here. The regulations are tight, but they're there to protect consumers, and ultimately we don't know the impact it will have on people using cannabis. Hemp, though, is not regulated like that yet, and I am a little afraid of some sort of foolish person or bad actor coming in and not looking at their product and testing it and ruining it for everybody else because they sent somebody a product that has a really high hit for methylene, you know, chloride or really yeah, a big high pit of pesticides. Which so if you're thinking about getting into hemp, please consider testing. I know it's a cost, but it, it will help your product, your reputation, and ultimately the public you know, health. Well, look, it, it'll also help the industry. The fact is, you know, it, uh, from our, our philosophy at Pop and Barkley is there's just one plant. It's all cannabis. And this artificial distinction of hemp yep. for the feds is exactly that. If you guys are in the hemp business, I encourage you to grow two different kinds of hemp. One that can offset cotton fo uh, carbon footprint, one that can create seeds for feedstock and hemp seed oil, and those are all awesome products that we need. The other, the other cultivars, even if they've had the THC bred out of them, that have lots of trichomes and glands, and that's where the API is. You know, if you guys don't know, CBD and all the tri and all the cannabinoids and terpenes exist in the trichome head, not in the bloodstream, not in the leaves, not in the socks, right? So you want a plant that's growing right. If you are growing that plant, you should be testing early and often. As we said before, cannabis is a great bioaccumulator, so whatever you were growing on that land previous may not have been picking up the heavy metals, the certain pesticides, right? So, and as largely, you know, CBD is now being viewed as something different, but it's an extension, of, it's the forward leading edge of cannabis uh, deregulation, right? And so it's important that we continue to self-regulate. What would be super bad is if somebody didn't test and did something or something happened that blew up in the face of CBD, because that would cascade back onto all cannabis and products, right? for everybody. Yep. Yeah, we don't, so we have to be really good about that. The other one I'd have is that there's a lot of test kits that are available. So there's one that came out of the, um, uh, what was the, uh, um, yes, the ACE, yeah, so that came out of um, Homeland Security. Right. So the Homeland Security, it's a quick, it's like a pregnancy test for, uh, for pesticides. So it looks at the carbamates and polyphosphates, um, organophosphates, excuse me. And so it'll do an accumulation of all those. So if you have something in a trim, you're definitely going to accumulate some of those into an um, extraction. Plus you can do thin layer chromatography. It's, it's like making tie dye. It costs you $300. You put a dot on a piece of silica. You wait five minutes, everything goes up, it separates, and you can see that. So very quickly, you can do your own testing. You don't have to have quantitative. You can see qualitative work that does it. The other one that brings me to mind is when you're talking about the, uh, the, the state will give you a letter very quickly, and then you might as well return the response on a blind German shepherd and send it out to the door. It'll eventually get there, um, but it's probably not quick. Question, are there refereed samples uh, available to send to labs so that we can know the uh, accuracy of the laboratories? Did you, what was this question? Is there such a thing in this industry as refereed samples? Those would be the, uh, so what they're trying to do, what we tried to do with Susan and, uh, and all the other committees, because I was on like five committees setting up standards, and what we tried to do is set up a reference standard, and then from the reference standard to go out to reference labs. There's a problem with that. You can't ship across state lines and have multiple labs look at it. So you can't do what we usually do in pesticides. You can't do what we usually do in, in aflatoxins. You can't send it to multiple labs around the country. You, you're, you're already handcuffed. And they well, they actually really would be handcuffed, wouldn't you? They try to spike hemp and send those out yeah. reference standards, but that's completely different too because if there's no THC present, that often interferes with the most you know, uh, difficult compounds to look at. So there's, there's all sorts of problems. There. It, it wasn't until 2014 I saw my first, so one of the chromatograms I had, I saw along the way, and we were saying, I looked at this one thing, and I knew it wasn't doing the Delta 9, I looked at this, that's all I've done all my life, this chromatogram, since 1972, this is what I did. And I can tell immediately, there's a shoulder, I can look at it and know something's wrong, and that's when we found 
It was 2014, we found delta eight, like we had just found delta eight, but we were using chromatographs that weren't that specific, and so it, it wouldn't separate those two. It saw them at the peak, but I could see the, and then we would put it on a good chromatogram, suddenly everyone's, oh, look, delta eight, no kidding. So they thought it was delta nine, it wasn't. Hi, so I'm just getting into the legal cultivation space, and I'm trying to figure out more so uh, what you're not, what you are, and what you're not allowed to have in your soils when you're growing. I'm pretty familiar with pesticide regulation, what you can and can't use, um, but I, I don't really understand. Like, it, do you have to send samples to labs of your soil for them to determine what's there? Um, like, you, if you could give me an overview of what you can and can't have in your soil and how it works within the so industry. So I'll, I'll awesome. let the panelists answer, but the first, yes, you should, because you want to just know what the composition is. Uh, my, I'm not a cultivator, especially a soil cultivator, so I would imagine it's heavy metals, but what else would you be oh, looking for? Pesticides. 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 Well, heavy metals, pesticides, uh, microbes, anything, anything that you can't have, have in the flower, you shouldn't have in your soil. Uh, and, and, and in fact, you know, it's hard to catch a break. break. You you might not even, that might not even be good, good enough. enough. 30, 30 years, years ago, they banned a pesticide called chlorinate. It's a chlorinated pesticide, and uh, they used to soak wood in that to treat and prevent termites. And even though that, that has been banned for 30 years, it's very persistent. And so if you buy a grow site that has wooden, you know, fixtures on it, yeah. uh, and you don't check that out, you're going to fail. And I say this because I've seen it more than one time. So, you know, not only do you want to check your soil, you want to check what's under your soil and what's under the, you know, like it can keep going. So, Arsenic. Arsenic, yeah. Everywhere. And it was fine to use arsenic until they realized it wasn't fine to use arsenic. Where we are in Humboldt, like previous mining operations, logging operations have caused that. And, you know, don't, you know, as they say, uh, as above, so below, remember your tap root of your cannabis plant. It's going deep, right? So even if you have a raised flower bed two feet, it doesn't mean that it's not going to break the ground and go there. So, yeah, you're going to want to excavate a certain amount and look under the soil and do some testing of your own. But, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think the answer is just keep testing and looking for anything that's untoward in your soil. We'll work with us early and often. Uh, with testing labs. Yeah. Hi, I'm not located in the state of California, and I just wanted to clarify. You're saying that we can't, if we're located, I'm, I'm located in Maryland, so... I can't ship samples across this country right now because of the possibility that it, I mean, it has THC. I'm specifically focused on hemp, not uh, marijuana, but because of that potential, you have, basically you have to find a lab in state or I, close yeah, well, to you. Luckily that's just changed with the advent of the farm bill. Yeah. You can now ship CBD products and I've taken it as far as even shipping concentrated CBD as work in progress using the flower COA. So what I would recommend is whatever your input product is, is coming with a, a certificate of analysis that says it's less than 0.3% THC. Hold on to that, because whether you dry sieve or whatever extraction methodology you use, your concentrate will likely be hot for THC. But as long as that's not what you're selling, I think you're fine. Uh, and there are many, many labs now that are getting on board looking and testing for CBD. Um, that's, that's even more wild, wild west. Like oh, These folks are working under the BCC, and there's a push to make it compliant. The national landscape is far, far more broad. Um, but Maryland also has, I believe, uh, a medical program that's pretty robust. So I'm sure there's plenty of in-state labs. Um, having a provider that's close to you so that you can go and be in their face, especially when the rubber meets the road, is probably important as well. So I would encourage you to look for a lab that's close if there's one available. Yeah, where, are you, where are you in Maryland? I'm Hyattsville right now, but I'm planning to uh, start my operation on the eastern shore. Okay, I, I know there's a steep hill in Columbia. Yeah, there's a steep hill. So check them out. And, and I would say there's, there's, also, there's also a chicken and an egg component. You know, <laughs> the FDA says that hemp is less than 0.3% THC. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the plant get the keef and press a rosin. That rosin, while the flower was less than 0.3, the rosin is usually 1 or 2 percent THC. But I look at that as a work in progress. And when I ship that to Colorado to my co-packer, because we do our national product co-packed in Colorado, I send it with the flower COA, not the rosin COA. And then the provider tests the rosin for its potency, and then they dilute it down into my formulation. And of course, the formulation ends up being totally legit, right? So, the, you know, again, the feds are artificially separating us, right? And that's on them. And they've made mistakes in the past. That's how we got here, right? So I just kind of turn a blind eye to that. It's like if I have a valid flower COA, meaning that that was a legal flower product, extracts from that product, as far as I'm concerned, are legal. They may not be legal there for distribution, no but they no are problem. in process, right? So I send you this rosin to work with or to test or evaluate. That's not the product I'm going to sell. I'm going to dilute that into my my yeah. whatever I'm making. Mind you, there, right. there is no language about uh, extraction or how to handle extra, uh, yeah, extracts right. uh, in the farm bill. The farm bill only... <laughs> Thank you.